civilization, taught free and life of freedoms, the invention of Greek civilization from the beginning, and of civilization in the Near East, from the death of Alexander to the Roman conquest, to the introduction of the prehistoric culture of Crete by Logan. Chapter 9, The Common Culture of Early Greece, Section 3, Literature. Literature, like religion, divided into three. The poets sang in the local dialect and often of their native scene. All Hellas listened to the more eloquent voices and stirred them now and then to broader themes. Time and prejudice have destroyed too much of this early poetry to let us feel its wealth and scope, its reputed vigor of utterance and finish of form. But as we move through the aisles, our cities of 6th century BCE, Greece, are wonder rises at the abundance and excellence of Greek literature before the Periclean age. The lyric poetry reflected an aristocratic society in which feeling, thought, and morals were free so long as they observed the amenities of breeding. This style of urbane and polished verse tended to disappear under the democracy. It had a rich variety of structure and meter, but seldom shackled itself with rhyme. Poetry meant to the Greeks feeling imaginatively and rhythmically expressed. Rhyme was most commonly confined to oracles and religious prophecies. While the lyric singers tuned their lyrics to love and war, the wandering bards in Greek men's halls recited in epic measures the heroic deeds of the race. Guilds of rhapsodies from rough times to stitch together an oid, a song, built up through generations a cycle of lays centering around the sieges of Thebes and Troy and the homecoming of the warriors. Song was socialized among these minstrels, each stitched his story together from earlier fragments, and none pretended to have composed the whole sequence of these tales. In Chaos, a clan of such rhapsodies called themselves Homerida, and claimed descent from a poet, Homer, who they said was the author of the epics that they recited throughout ancient Greece. Perhaps this blind bard was but an eponym, the imaginary ancestor of a tribe or group, like Helen, Doris, or Ion. The Greeks of the 6th century BCE attributed to Homer not only the Iliad and the Odyssey, but all the other epics then existing, the Homeric poems, are the oldest epics known to us, but their very existence, as well as their many references to earlier bards, suggest that these surviving epics stand at the end of a long line of development from simple lays to lengthy stitched songs. In 6th century Athens, possibly under Salon, probably under Pisistratus, a governmental commission selected or collated the Iliad and the Odyssey from the epic literature of the preceding century, assigned them to Homer, and edited, perhaps wove them into substantially their present shape. It is one of the miracles of the literature that these poems so complex in origin achieve in the end so artistic a result. It is quite true that both in language and in structure, the Iliad 
falls considerably this side of perfection, that the Aalian and Ionic forms are mingled as if by some polyglot, Smyrna, and that the meter requires now one dialect and now the other, that the plot is marred by inconsistencies, changes of plan, and emphasis, and contradictions of character, that the same heroes are killed two or three times over in the course of the tale, that the original theme, the wrath of Achilles, and its results, is interrupted and obscured by a hundred episodes, nevertheless taken from other lays, and sewn into the epic at every scene, nevertheless, in its larger aspects, the story is one. The language is powerful and vivid. The poem is all in all the greatest that ever sounded on the lips of men. Well, maybe in that world. Um, but, you know, from that you see how the Bible, with its hundreds of contradictions, felt like over. Coming from the world that looks so well on a poem with all those issues. Such an epic could have begun only in the active and exuberant youth of the Greeks, and could have been completed only in their artistic maturity. Its characters are nearly all warriors. Are there women, even the philosophers, like Nestor, put up in in vilely good fight? These individuals are intimately and sympathetically conceived, and perhaps the finest thing in all Greek literature is the unbiased manner in which we are made to feel now with Hector, now with Achilles, in his tent Achilles, a surly, unheroic, and an unlikable figure, complaining to his mother that his luck does not befit him in his semi-divinity, and that Agamemnon has stolen his plum. The unhappy Theseus, letting the Greeks die by the thousands, while he eats and pouts and sleeps in his ship, are his text. Sending Patroclus unaided to death, and then rending the air with unmanly limitations, when finally he goes out to battle, he is not stirred by patriotism, but mad with grief over the loss of his son. In his rage, he loses all decency and sinks to savage cruelty with both Lataan and Hector. In truth, he is an undeveloped mind, unsettled and uncontrolled, and overshadowed with prophecies of death. Nay, friend, he says to the fallen Lataan, who sue for mercy, die like another. To which thou, vainly weeping, Patroclus died, it was far better than thou. Look upon me. Am I not beautiful and tall, and sprung with a good father, and a goddess, the mother, that bear me? Yet, lo, death is over me, and the mighty hand of doom. There cometh a dawn of day, a noon or an evening, and a hand that I, I know not, so lay me dead. So he stabs the unresisting Akaan through the neck, flings the body, the river, and makes one of those grandiose speeches that adorn the slaughter in the Iliad, and laid the foundation for oratory among the Greeks. Half of Hellas worshipped Achilles for centuries as a god. We accept him and forgive him as a child. At the worst, he is one of the supreme creations of the poetic mind. What carries us along through the Iliad when we do not have to study or translate it, is not merely these characterizations, so numerous and diverse, nor merely the flow and turmoil of the tale, but the rushing splendor of the verse. It must be admitted that Homer repeats, as well as nods, it is part of his plan to recall as many refrains, certain epithets and lines. So he sings with fond repetition, Amos de Ergenaia, Anna 
Rhododactylus eos emos de ericenia tani Rhododactylus eos when appeared the morning's daughter rosy fingered dawn but if these are flaws they are lost in the brilliance of the language and the wealth of similes that now and then amid the shock of war calm us with the quiet beauty of peaceful fields as when flies in swarming myriads haunt the herds man's stalls in springtime when new milk has filled the pails in such vast multitudes mustered the long-haired greeks upon the plain are As when among the deep dells of an arid mountain side, a great fire burns its way and the thick wood before it is consumed and shifting winds, hither and thither sweeps the flames so ranged. Achilles in his fury through the field from side to side and everywhere overtook his victims and the earth ran dark with blood. The Palestine is so different from all this that from the outset one suspects its separate authorship. Even some of the Alexandrian scholars suggested this, and all the critical authority of Aristarchus was required to hush the dispute. The Odyssey agrees with the Iliad in certain standard phrases. Owl-eyed Athena, long-haired Greeks, wine-dark sea, rosy-fingered dawn, which may have been taken from the same horde and poetical tradition into which the authors of the Iliad had dipped their pins. But the Odyssey contains an array of words apparently brought into use after the Iliad was composed. In the second epic, we hear frequently of iron, or the early one spoke of bronze. We hear of writing, of private property, and land, of freedmen, and emancipation, none of which are mentioned in the Iliad. What are considered to be gods, and their functions are different. The meter is the same, the dactylic hexameter, as in all the Greek epics, but the style, and spirit, and substance are so far from the Iliad that if one author wrote both poems, he was a paragon of complexity and a master of all moods. The new poet is more literary and philosophical, less violent and warlike than the old, more self-conscious and meditative, leisurely and civilized. So gentle, indeed, that Bentley thought the Odyssey had been composed for the special benefit of women. Whether here, too, we have poets rather than a poet is harder to say, and in the case of the Iliad, there are signs of suture, but the stitching seems more skillful than in the older epic. The plot, though devious, turns out in the end to be remarkably consistent, worthy almost of contemporary dictioneers. From the beginning, the conclusion is foreshadowed. Every episode advances it, and it's coming it binds all the books into a whole. Probably the epic was built upon pre-existing ways, as in the case of the Iliad, but the work of unification is far more complete. We may conclude with a high degree of diffidence that the Odyssey is a century younger than the Iliad, and is predominantly the work one man. The characters are less vigorously and vividly conceived than in the Iliad. Penelope is shadowy and never quite emerges from behind her loom, except in the end, when a moment of doubt, perhaps of regret, flits through her mind at the return of her master. The tone is clear and unique. Here the 
losses of a thousand ships and the cause of ten thousand deaths is still as a goddess among women, maturely lovely in her middle age, gentler and quieter than before, but as proud as ever, and taking gracefully for granted all the attentions that had to the queen. And remember that all these male and female divinities are really um, largely exaggerations or projections of the human condition. Now, Sika is pretty pretty essay in the male understanding of women. We hardly expect so delicate and romantic a picture from the Greek. Climacus is uncertainly drawn and affected with hesitation as by some Hamlet touch, but Adasu is the most complete and complex portrait in Greek poetry. All in all, the Adasu is a fascinating novel in engaging verse full of tender sentiment and an adventurous surprise, more interesting to an unwarlike and aging soul than the majestic and bloody Iliad. These poems, sole survivors of a long succession of epics, became the most precious element in the literary heritage of Greece. Homer was a staple of Greek education, the repository of Greek myth, the source of a thousand dramas, the foundation of moral training, and the strangest of all, grave Bible of Orthodox theology. It was Homer and Hesiod, says Herodotus, probably with some hyperbole, who gave definite and human form to the Olympians and ordered the hierarchy of heaven. There is much that is magnificent in Homer's gods, and we come to like them for their failings. But scholars have long since detected in the poets pictured them a wallaking skepticism hardly befit the National Bible. These deities quarrel like relatives, fornicate like fleas, and share with mankind what seemed to Alexander the stigmata of morality, the need for love and sleep. They do everything human but hunger and die. And not one of them could bear comparison with but as use in intelligence, with Hector in heroism, with Andromache in tenderness, or with Nestor in dignity. Only a poet of the 6th century BCE, versed in Ionian doubt, could have made such farcelings of the gods. It is one of the humors of history that these epics, in which the Olympians have essentially the function of comic relief, were referenced throughout Hellas as props respectable morality and belief. Eventually, the anomaly proved explosive. The humor destroyed the belief, and the moral development of men rebelled against the superseded morals of the gods. And again, I call to compare with the Bible that, you know, the capriciousness, you could say, you know, one time something's forbidden, one time something's lawful, and it's not like it's been about different age. It's, it just seems to be conflict. Um, the sorts of things that can be supported from one group but not the other, um, that was obviously a problem too. And, you know, you have a god that hisses and all sorts of other stuff that you wouldn't think would be fitting of ultimate divinity, according to the Bible. And in the New Testament, it everything wrong just adds itself on it with, well, instead of telling humans how they can be forgiven, I'm going to murder, have my son murdered. You know, like a human sacrifice to the devil or something.